welcome everybody uh, to uh, what you might call uh, the White House Eviction Prevention Summit, the sequel or the webinar. Um, we're really, really uh, happy with the turnout, with the interest, with the heartfelt uh, uh, action that people have taken um, uh, for uh, Erica Pothig at the White House and others uh, and myself and Treasury and HUD, the team doing this, we had no desire to do a summit for summit's sake or panel for panel's sake. This is about action. This is about making sure people are using the emergency rental assistance funds. This is about making sure that landlords and tenants know that this is a win-win solution. This is a solution that can provide complete back rent and utilities uh, while for landlords, while helping to keep more families in safe and stable housing. So this has always been about action. And that is why we brought together 46 cities uh, for the initial White House summit. This is why we have opened this up and done a considerable more outreach and discussion with cities, with counties, with grantees, with landlords, with, with advocacy groups, because this is about action. We have been inspired uh, by what has happened since the White House summit. We've been inspired by the different concrete steps that people have taken, uh, uh, which we hope were in part inspired by our summit, but whatever the inspiration was, it's the action uh, uh, that counts. And today is a chance for those of you who have been were part of that, or both those of you tuning in now, to get clarifications and uh, uh, answers uh, from uh, the lead officials at Treasury, at HUD, at the White House, uh, to, but most importantly, to hear from each other. Uh, you're going to hear in the various segments about things people are doing on diversionary, on rental assistance, on legal assistance, uh, because that's what we know we have heard. People want to hear what are other people doing? How are they succeeding? How are they overcoming obstacles? Um, so um, uh, that is our purpose. Now, we start with the view and the understanding that there has never been a national infrastructure for preventing unnecessary evictions. Uh, and we are being asked, all of us, to build that infrastructure uh, quickly, immediately, in a decentralized uh, uh, manner. Uh, that's a challenge, but it cannot be an excuse. It's a responsibility. It's an opportunity. We have a responsibility, each of us, to do everything we can. Every preventable eviction is a preventable heartbreak for a family. Every preventable eviction is a preventable heartbreak for families. We have to do everything we can to prevent each and every one. When we think about our responsibility, uh, we do not feel that because money's allocated or we finished our initial guidance, we're done. Uh, we do not feel just because it is at the state and locality level to set up these programs that that takes away any of our responsibility. Uh, we have, from the start, been trying to listen, to learn, and respond quickly. Uh, do whatever we can to help get the funds out to the people who need them, to the landlords and the tenants that can allow us to uh, prevent these heartbreaks, that can allow, that can prevent uh, landlords who rely on this income from themselves uh, experiencing economic distress and certainly for the tenant families. So we have listened and we have tried to uh, respond uh, as, as strongly as we can. Uh, on May 7th and June 24th, we put out additional guidance, significant guidance. Uh, this was based on things we heard about the difficulty with documentation, the need for simpli more simplified sense of eligibility, for the need for bulk payments, uh, for the need to clarify that you could help families who are already homeless or help families find future housing, or to make clear that you can give help directly to tenants, if, particularly if landlords do not respond immediately. All of these things are us 
listening to people on the ground about what we can do to help make sure that this program is working. The numbers that came out for June that just were announced today by Treasury are a sign that we are making substantial progress, but that we have a substantial way to go. Uh, $1.5 billion was given out. That was about twice as much as the previous months. Uh, 290,000 uh, families were helped. That is about three times more than in April. That's significant progress, but it's not where we need to be. We still have a substantial way to go. Um, and uh, again, we, uh, we do not feel that we are done. We want to listen. We are willing to continue to make adjustments, to make policies, to use our convening power, to do whatever we can to make sure this program is working. But I do want to be clear. We have listened and provide tools. Uh, and it is important for people to use them. When we suggest that you can rely more, when, when we say that you can use more self-attestation, categorical eligibility, factual product, uh, predicates, bulk payments, that you can help tenants directly. That's not just allowing, it's not a suggestion. We are encouraging, we are asking people to do what they can. This is not a time to hide behind being overly conservative, overly cautious, or overly complacent. There is too much at stake. These, there are real tools out there. Also, there's too much success out there. Yes, we have dramatically further to go, but on each of these areas, whether it is uh, self-attestation or bulk payments, there are people and places doing it right. There is no real excuse that it cannot be done. Uh, your peers are showing that it can be. So it's on all of us. All of, none of us have done everything we can. All of us have to go the extra mile. All of us uh, uh, have to step up. Now, I said it was responsibility and an opportunity, and it is both, because we are dealing with a crisis situation from the pandemic. And we are dealing with a sense of urgency because the eviction moratorium is set to end on July 31st. So we have uh, an emergency and immediate responsibility to help every family. And there are many who have been hurt and are, not, are at risk of not being able to stay in their home or keep up with our payments. That is our immediate urgent responsibility. But there is also opportunity here. Matthew Desmond estimates that 3.6 million Americans are evicted every year pre-pandemic. That's the average between 2000 and 2016. And a huge a number of them are evicted for only five or $600 or one or two months. So this is a challenge that is an immediate challenge and a long-term challenge. And all of us have the, the responsibility to help with this immediate crisis and the opportunity, if I can quote somebody familiar to many of us, to build this back better, to have a stronger long-term system that prevents the unnecessary heartbreaks that take place with unnecessary evictions. So uh, we are bringing people back together because we believe the diversionary policies are an example of something that is working well in many places and can be uh, uh, applied more uh, uh, broadly and could make a big difference. With the money from the emergency rental assistance, we have more win-win opportunities. Now, when somebody goes into a diversionary program, uh, it's not like a settlement. It is the opportunity for a landlord to be made whole and a tenant family to keep their housing. So this is uh, 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 our chance to step up, learn from each other, and take immediate action uh, on these diversionary win-win uh, policies. Um, with that, uh, we will start uh, by me turning it over to someone who I think is an extraordinary public servant, uh, Noel Pollo, who has had the uh, we work in an interagency way uh, with all of us working together as a team. 
uh, but the but Noel is the person who has that line responsibility at Treasury, uh, and he has been a great example of somebody who has listened, learned, and worked together with all of us to respond, uh, and will continue to do so going forward. So with that, let me turn over to Noel. Thank you, Gene. Um, it's a it's a privilege to follow you here, and and thank you everybody for for joining us. I'm going to uh, share a screen here. Um, and hopefully that will come up nicely. All right. And just double checking that we can move through this well. Um, so listen, Gene, uh, really captured, I think the passion and focus that you, uh, uh, should, you should hear from us today and that is shared by the teams that are working on this. Um, my name is Noel Andres Pollo. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community and Economic Development at Treasury. Um, and I have the privilege of leading the emergency housing team. Um, and I, I'm gonna sort of double click on some of the things that Jean uh, said, uh, give a little bit of context and a little bit of depth, but I, I, I hope you'll hear me really uh, uh, hitting many of the same thematic notes. Um, listen, so, so the, this began with a set of resources that, as Gene said, sort of transforms the opportunity uh, uh, to, to address this, uh, this fact that we had so much eviction happening in this country. ERA-1, which was appropriated in December, ERA-2 as a part of the American Rescue Plan. And then it's, it's good for us also to remember that as a part of the, re the American Rescue Plan, there's state and local fiscal recovery funds which are also very flexible and can be used for these purposes, right? So um, the, 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 the Congress, the, the, the president um, has, has made available these, these resources. And um, Gene correctly laid out the challenge. Um, and I think he was right to say, it's a challenge, not an excuse. That's how we feel about it. Um, it's hard, sure it's hard, let's solve it, right? And, and so um, when we walked in the door, uh, there was not a national infrastructure for delivering on these programs. You look at the amount of rental assistance that was provided uh, prior to this year, and it was comparatively very, very little um, as compared to the, the enormous resources that are available. And so um, that infrastructure was not out there. And that's a challenge for many grantees to hire the staff, to, to, to make the policies, to hire the contractors, to get the websites up, all of these things. And, and it would be wonderful to be uh, in a situation or to have been in a situation where all of that was already in place. Uh, but that, that's, that's not where we were as a nation. And so um, that's what the first quarter was, was, was building uh, these systems in places de in a decentralized way all over uh, the country. And, you know, the Treasury early on uh, made these dollars available rapidly, consistently with, uh, uh, with the statutes and um, also changed program rules that have been put in place by the prior administration you know, working on documentation barriers from day one. Um, but, but we recognize the scale of this challenge. Um, this administration recognized it and responded with not a, not a treasury approach, but, but, a, but a whole of government approach. And, um, you know, Gene has been this sort of extraordinary partner and his team um, and have been extraordinary partners along with the Domestic Policy Council. The White House has leaned in uh, to, to make this successful, right? Um, and it's, it's been quite amazing and catalytic, I would say. Um, and our partners across the gun government, HUD, CFPB, USDA, the US Digital Service, each have been engaged since early on in sort of making this a success. And indeed, this, this summit itself is a reflection of this whole of government uh, approach uh, to, uh, to making sure that we, that we meet the needs regardless uh, of the challenges. Um, and so Gene said a word about that sort of responsive policymaking. You know, when we walked in the door, certainly we, we moved immediately on, on some urgent things about uh, uh, some of the, the rules that had been put in place prior, um, but we listened, right? That, that was not enough. And so we heard uh, uh, from advocates, from, uh, from grantees, from landlord associations, a wide range of other stakeholders. We've listened to researchers. We've, we've just had people come through and, and, and lay out data and ideas. And we've turned that into policymaking. Frankly, almost every month you've seen next steps taken. Um, and so 
the self-certification issue is, uh, is critical. It's really important. We hear from grantees all over the country that by using self-certification, they, they've taken down the amount of time it takes and the burden uh, required of, of tenants and landlords. Um, and we, we studied sort of what is it about that process of, of paperwork and getting people through the pipeline that's taking the most time. And we found that in many cases that was income certification, right? And so we came out and said, in addition to being able to do self-certification um, uh, for, for income, also you can use self-certification and a fact-based proxy. If a, if a locality or a state really feels like they need a little bit more on top of that certification, um, being able to identify, uh, for example, a census tract or a rural county where the large majority of people are low income that meet the statutory definition, okay, we can match those things up, right? So these kinds of sort of nitty gritty solutions is, is what we've been trying to engage in and make clear our, our opportunities uh, for grantees to increase their spending to move more quickly. Um, we have clearly discouraged creating additional documentation barriers. Um, we've clarified that uh, eviction prevention and diversion activities are eligible expenses, right? Where there has been a question, we have tried to answer it uh, uh, very quickly. Um, and even recently, you know, thinking about, look, priority number one is to save every tenancy, to prevent every heartbreak, as, as Gene said, right? Um, we also recognize that that, we, that that may not happen in every case. And so it also matters to us, right, that we shorten that time in which a household may be without a home um, to prevent the sort of corrosive effects of, of homelessness. And so we've, we've thought about uh, we put out this idea of a letter of intent that, um, you know, there's a statutory requirement that says a household to be eligible has to have a rental obligation. And that's a tough one to get around, right? But what we said was, look, give that, uh, uh, that, that family a letter that says to that next landlord, this is what we will pay. And then we created incentive for states and, and localities um, and in the ERA1 tribes to, to use this. They, there's an obligation deadline coming up in September. Well, the full value of that letter of intent can be obligated, right? Can be recorded as an obligation. And so we're trying to be realistic and think through, and we do that by talking with our partners and, and grantees out there. So I just wanted to give you a sense of kind of that, a little bit of that nitty gritty, and per perhaps I've gone in the weeds too much, but I, I really do want, want you to understand that that's where this lives. It is about solving problem by problem, taking action, as Gene said. And that action is, result, is, is producing results. We have a lot further to go. But what we've said is, is providing these flexibilities, this kind of responsive policymaking would make a difference. The data is showing that. Today, we released information about uh, a, a spending on assistance to eligible households. That's rent, utilities, arrearage um, in the month of June. And this is just a graph that gives you a sense of the hundreds of thousands of people who are getting access to assistance uh, in each reporting period. Um, and it's also just worth noting that our data from the first quarter indicates that a very large percentage of assistance is going to the lowest income households, which we think was a good early indicator. Um, but we expect this trend to continue, but I think there is enough here to call it a trend. And, and we've got a lot more work to do, but, uh, but, but we are encouraged that, that the data is bearing out this responsive policymaking. And I just, you know, there's a lot more to do, right? We, this is what we wake up and say to ourselves every morning, right? And so we are engaged in an effort to raise awareness more through a call to action to our partners, our, our, our interagency partners, nonprofits, private companies, uh, local and state governments to let people know that rental assistance is available and achievable. And I want to—I just want to make this point that I know that there's been a lot of focus on, well, it's not happening fast enough, and people aren't getting it soon enough. And and I agree with that, honestly, right? I, 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 we hold a high standard for ourselves, right? But but we also don't want to tell tenants that it's not possible because money is flowing. People are getting access to assistance, and we want them to know there's more there. Come in the door, take a chance. Let's make this work, right? That's a, that's a message we hope we can get out. Um, the, these conversations through this summit and the, and, and the lead up to it have been just catalytic, just, just excellent. And thank you to all of you. Um, we've been seeing all of this incoming from around the country about real action being taken. 
we understand that the people on this call really get that. Um, and, and just a final point, I, I just want to say that for us, for all of us, July 31st is not the end of a sprint. It's an important date. That in, the end of the moratorium is an important date but it's not the end of our sprint. We can deliver just-in-time assistance to people in August, uh, uh, God willing, in, in September. In September. Um, we are at full bore on this, and we will continue to be. There will be no let up. We're, we are going to get to as many people as we possibly can, um, and, uh, and you have that, that dedication and promise from us. Um, at this point, I, I wanna turn it uh, over to, to my colleagues, uh, I'm going to pull this screen share down. Um, my colleague uh, 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 Clarence Wardell, um, uh, a leader in the White House, and and back to Gene as well, I believe, um, who uh, who have really been at at the center of these efforts. Um, and so, uh, Clarence and Gene, I'm I'm going I'm going back to you. Great, thank you, Noel. Um, really appreciate that um, that overview of of where uh, Treasury. Um, uh, has been really a leader uh, on, on a lot of this work, and I appreciate really, I know, your responsiveness um, and your team's responsiveness to questions um, that have come from the field and your engagement with the field. Um, as Jean mentioned at the top, um, though, as well, that there are, there are plenty of examples um, across the country of where the work is getting done um, and where folks are leading, coming up with new ways to serve. And so we know that, um, as Noel has just answered and, and it continues to answer questions from his team, uh, but there's nothing like kind of hearing how, how folks are actually solving the problems themselves and, 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 and to be able to lift up some of those examples. And so uh, we wanted to offer um, some time today to hear um, from from some of the practitioners, from the, some of the, your peers and folks in the field who are, who are doing the work, um, and really to highlight a few different areas, one of which um, we want to discuss, um, you know, how jurisdictions are doing outreach, raising awareness around the work, reaching those populations that may be skeptical that the resources are actually real, true, and accessible, um, to talk about some of the mechanics of how um, these programs are being implemented and services are being delivered and rental assistance is being delivered. And then at the end, a little bit um, um, on how to partner with legal aid organizations um, to provide um, tenants and, and uh, with, with other options as they're moving through the process. And so um, just for the initial section, we'll hear from uh, three, three leaders in the space, Per Olstead, uh, Jenny Delwood, and Christina Livingston. And let me just take a moment take a to moment say that uh, what Per has been doing at the CFPB is just uh, a tremendous uh, and I think as he'll talk about next Wednesday, we will have a tool that we will highlight dramatically to help people uh, be able to find the assistance they need. But I just want to say uh, that, that this has uh, just been a critical, critical contribution by Pear and his colleagues at CFPB. Um, but uh, uh, Pear, do you want to take it from here? Hey, thanks, Gene. Appreciate that. Um, bear with me for a moment, folks. I am going to share my screen just to provide a couple brief visuals as I'm talking. I'll try to keep my remarks brief to keep the agenda moving. Um, but I want to get this up on screen. And there we go. Um, Okay, uh, sorry, I have to, I'm, I'm required to put the disclaimer up from the CFB uh, General Counsel, but there it is. Um, so uh, as everyone has already said, um, uh, our goal at the CFB is the same as everyone else's. Um, in coordination with our federal colleagues, we are doing whatever we can to help connect financially struggling uh, homeowners, renters, and landlords with the resources they need to stay in their homes and to stay in control of their finances. The centerpiece of that effort is what's on screen now. It's the interagency housing assistance portal that we're hosting on the CFPB's website. That's consumerfinance.gov slash housing. The interagency portal has resources to help homeowners, renters, and landlords understand the options that are available to them and the actions they can take to get help. It includes information on behalf of the CFPB, FHFA, HUD, USDA, Veterans Affairs, and the Treasury provides accessible information through videos, through uh, uh, plain language explanation, links to relevant resources, clear guidance on the action steps people need to take to stay in their homes. We provide the site in English, Spanish, traditional Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog, and Arabic. 
And perhaps more importantly to all of you, uh, as part of the site, we offer a digital toolkit that you or anyone can use to help increase awareness of the resources to those who need it. The toolkit features shareable content for newsletters, blogs, emails, social media, printable flyers, uh, video content, whatever channels you use to get the word out in your communities. We're continually updating the resources we're making available. Um, as Jean said, next week we will have a significant update for the entire portal, including a search tool to help find rental assistance programs, as well as a suite of information you all can use to share that information out in your communities. If you have any questions about how to use these materials, please don't hesitate to contact us at cfpbpress at cfpb.gov. Again, that's cfpbpress at cfpb.gov. We also greatly appreciate your feedback on the resources we make available, positive or negative, especially if there's anything that will be helpful to you that is not in the toolkit, um, that's something we can create, please let us know. Um, we're eager to work with you all. Again, as Jean said, we'll be we have a fairly significant launch of new resources coming next week, next Wednesday. Um, we'll be providing more assistance. I think we'll share that out offline. Um, but in closing, I'll just echo what others have said. These are sobering times. Millions of people have been impacted by the financial hardships brought on by the pandemic, but the tools are in place to provide the assistance needed. We just need to connect those resources with the people who need them most. So thank you to all of you for the, everything you've already been doing and everything you will do over the coming weeks and months. At the CFPB, we are honored uh, to support you all in that work. And I think next I turn it over to Jenny Delwood from Stay House Delay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jenny Delwood from the State House LA program in Los Angeles. We are a comprehensive eviction prevention and defense program, including public awareness, outreach, workshops, legal assistance, and tenant navigation. We help tenants understand their rights and exercise them. We proactively outreach to rent burden tenants via phone and text and offer know your rights workshops and support accessing rental assistance. We also connect tenants to direct legal assistance, including in-court representation uh, to prevent eviction, address tenant harassment, approve, improve habitability, and a variety of other tenant challenges. Thus far, we have reached over 220,000 tenants, provided more than 10,000 tenants with legal counsel, and represented over 500 tenants in court. This is a countywide program funded by both the County of Los Angeles, the City of Los Angeles, in addition to the cities of Long Beach and Santa Monica, as well as other government partners. This is an unprecedented public-private partnership that includes nine legal service providers and 14 community-based tenant organizations. So what makes this program effective? First off, a centralized website and phone hotline to sign up for workshops and get referred to an attorney in a tenant's neighborhood that works in the courthouse where they live. We have a coordinated countywide program that blends multiple government sources of funding and private funding sources from philanthropy into a one-stop shop for eviction prevention and defense. Instead of competing against one another for grants and government partners, or rather uh, for grants or resources, our government partners, legal service providers, and community-based organizations, as well as philanthropy, came together to jointly build this program. Specific to outreach, we engage in culturally relevant outreach, education, and legal assistance in multiple languages. And we lead the outreach of, by trusted community organizations that have bases in communities of color, in low-income communities who speak the language and know how to best communicate, whether in person or virtually. We also utilize targeted digital advertising and media engagement, again, in multiple languages, targeted to highly rent burden neighborhoods. I'm gonna share my screen very briefly uh, to showcase the website that we've created. As you can see, uh, the website includes uh, very clear information about how to know your rights, get legal help and find a workshop with a variety of languages. And this is just the beginning for us. We plan uh, to scale the program over the next six years to an ultimate goal of a universal right to counsel in Los Angeles County, included a codified right to counsel as well as expanded Stay House LA program so that we can serve everybody in need. 
We look forward to as well providing deeper case management to access rental assistance and navigate the complex system of the court system and keep more people housed. Thank you so much. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Christina Livingston with ACE. Christina, you're up. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Livingston. I'm the executive director of ACE, which is a community organization in California. We're a super proud member of Stay Housed LA. Um, and I'll just say that for us in this process, we have learned that there are three real levels of outreach and education that has to be done in order to really reach particularly the folks that need the most help and are less likely to get help from any other source. So the first is that, actually, let me turn on my timer. Uh, the first is that we've got to make sure that we are doing outreach in all kinds of ways. So we do peer-to-peer -peer texting, we do door-to-door -door flyering and face-to-face -face conversations, we call voter lists and renter lists, we do social media ads that we boost, culturally relevant and timely social media posts. Um, we've got regional clinics. We've got Facebook Live clinics. We're finding every way possible to reach particularly the lowest income folks and people who are um, not usually tapped into, plugged into other out outlets and able to really get just the information that rental assistance is available for folks. Secondly, education. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of cynicism and skepticism. So particularly in our workshops and in our face-to-face -face conversations, we're working to debunk some of those myths um, and teach people you know, how to navigate the site, what documents are required, and what they can expect in terms of just the process of how long it takes to get a response, what kinds of responses you might get, what happens if you get denied, you know, how to appeal, those kinds of things. And then maybe the most important layer, is directed assistance for people who are not able to navigate the site on their own. So when, that's, when that happens, when we have folks who say, I'm interested, I deeply need this help, and I don't know how to, I can't figure out this site, I don't know how to upload, I don't have a scanner, we will either have people come in and meet us in our office, or we will go to them, go to their doors, and actually help them scan in their information, put in their documents, walk them through, and sort of hold them in, in a case management kind of way. And we'll do that in language. We mostly operate in English and in Spanish, um, and we'll connect them to other folks if we if they need a language that we're not able to provide. That piece is the most critical. But I will say that the thing that underlies all of our ability to really get the word out and help people apply and get this money is that we have been able to get really strong eviction protections in here in California so that we're not actually battling both people's uh, worry about fighting evictions while we're also helping them try and find this uh, access to this money. And that there's a really strong uh, feedback loop between folks on the ground like ourselves and the folks who are administering the program so that we can say very quickly, like, you know, the site is not working well in this way or people are confused about this kind of response and that they're actually making those things happen. So um, the final thing I'll just say is that because we don't have voluntary landlord participation, it also makes this program so much more effective. So really, um, between those three pieces, outreach, education, and assistance, hands-on assistance, that has been what we've found most effective in being able to get the money into the, the pocket of the folks who need it. I'll turn it back to Clarence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina and Pear and Jenny. Um, that is really um, a critical piece of all of this, the top of the funnel. Um, and then the, the, the second piece of this becomes where are we following folks to? And so just with the next uh, uh, group of presenters, we're going to hear um, from some of the programs that are being implemented and some of the folks who have stood those up. And so uh, with this group, we'll be hearing from Zach Newman, um, who's with uh, the COVID-19 Eviction Defense Project in Colorado, Andrew Bradley of Prosperity, Indiana, Kyle Webster of Action Housing in Pittsburgh, and Heidi Boyd of Hennepin County, Minnesota. And I'll, I'll just say uh, that what I said before that uh, Zach Newman and the COVID-19 Eviction Defense Project were, I think, one of the first to, um, you know, to help inform me personally of their actions long before COVID. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's just an example of uh, how different things individual people do have a ripple effect uh, in helping the rest of us. Uh, get ideas going forward. So let me turn it over to you, Zach. Uh, thanks, Gene, and, and good everyone to be on. Uh, appreciate the 
the time and the space to talk about this. Uh, my name is Zach Newman. I'm the executive director of the COVID-19 Eviction Defense Project in Denver, Colorado. Our organization provides a continuum of care of housing related services across legal aid, resource navigation, rental assistance processing and community organizing. Um, our rental assistance model is based on an experience I had last August representing a client. Uh, the client had lost her job because of COVID, was caring for her terminally ill husband and was trying to support her 12 year old son who like a lot of kids last year was going to school on Zoom. When she couldn't make rent, she applied for rental assistance and she also sought legal representation. Despite my representation and despite applying in a timely fashion for rental assistance, she was evicted. The rental assistance check showed up a few weeks later and uh, I think she and I and, and all of us were, were pretty deeply frustrated by that. I think for our team, this highlighted two problems. One, in Colorado, lawyers are incredibly important, but they're not enough. And then two, rental assistance often moves too slowly to be effective in a fast moving eviction timeline. So in response to these problems, we've worked with Colorado partners like Peter LaFerry at Maker Housing Partners, local legal services to build a rental assistance vehicle that can pay out within 48 hours. Um, to make our model work, we've established an in-house capital revolver um, that we make rapid payment from and then replenish through reimbursable contracts with state and county governments. The capital base of the revolver is a multi-million dollar zero percent interest line of credit from the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority and reimbursement is through contracts with housing authorities, counties in the state. In recent weeks, we've expanded this beyond just our organization and are now offering rapid processing and payment services in partnerships with neighborhood organizations, local legal services providers, and other groups that are serving the community and trying to provide rental assistance. Uh, for us, this solves a lot of problems. It ensures that tenants receiving money are often paired with a lawyer or a navigator or a community representative who can ensure they won't be evicted after the money arrives. Uh, but it, it also means that ledgers are correct. They don't include late fees, that the processing works in a way that's beneficial to tenant and landlord. I think most importantly though, it reallocates the risk of delayed payments away from tenants who are facing eviction, and of course, landlords who need to make their mortgage payments, and it puts it squarely on our organization. So we as a nonprofit and a nonprofit with that capital revolver and back-end funding can sit on the risk of that non-payment or that delayed payment much more effectively than a tenant or a landlord can. Um, we're beginning to see the benefit of the approach. At the end of June, a nonprofit legal services provider contacted us on a Friday afternoon. They had a client who had a judgment and a writ of restitution the sheriff was coming on Monday, but the landlord said they would dismiss if the money was in hand by Monday. Uh, one of our tenant advocates worked through the weekend, she gathered all the documents, and on Monday that check went out and the eviction didn't take place. So I, I think this model is working for us in Colorado. I think there are opportunities to expand it. I would also share in closing that we think this model does have potential to be duplicated in other jurisdictions and other parts of the country. Uh, either using PRI or grant dollars from foundations to set up revolvers that can pay quickly and then reimburse against federal dollars. So we would be happy to share the model, share the background and talk to anyone who's interested. But thank you again for having us on and excited to hear from everyone else. I believe Andrew Bradley is next. Thank you so much, Zach. And thanks to Clarence and Jean and to the White House for your leadership and ongoing efforts on this critical issue. Um, I'm Andrew Bradley with Prosperity Indiana and the Indianapolis Summit Working Group to talk about equitable distribution of rental assistance. Indianapolis and Indiana have a pre-existing eviction crisis with disproportionately unequal impacts that have only been exacerbated by COVID. Even before the pandemic, Indianapolis had the second highest number of evictions among all U.S. cities and was one of three cities in Indiana in the top 20 highest eviction rates nationwide. Since the pandemic began, there have been over 51,000 evictions filed statewide in Indiana, nearly double any other state tracked by Eviction Lab, and 17,000 in Indianapolis alone. Indianapolis also has one of the strongest correlations between high eviction filings and low vaccination rates. We know that low income renter households, black and brown Hoosiers, and renter families with children have suffered the most housing instability during the pandemic. And we know that the evictions um, cause long term economic damage to families that can last over a decade, and that a new wave of evictions at the end of the CDC moratorium would overburden local community services already stretched thin. 
Um, however, Indianapolis and other uh, communities in Indiana are currently limited by state legislation and policies in the proactive eviction prevention steps they can take, including notification of tenant rights or programs, eviction sealing or expungement, requiring settlement diversion programs, and other tools allowed in other states that can't be implemented here without state action. But the stakes are too high to not make every effort to ensure emergency rental assistance and American Rescue Plan Act resources reach the families, providers, and communities who need them most. That's why our Indianapolis working group that includes city ERA program officials, local and state court officials, legal aid organizations, and local housing advocates is focusing on actions to ensure equitable implementation of ERA resources that can serve as a model to scale statewide. We've created a framework to ensure ERA program is visible, accessible, and preventative, and that it connects with other recovery resources in the courts and throughout communities. The participants in this working group will engage community stakeholders, including housing providers, public officials, low-income tenants, and Black, Indigenous, and other people of color to implement a checklist to strengthen equitable marketing and targeting of ERA and other recovery programs, such as nutrition and workforce development, and exploring alignment with funds from the community engagement portion of the American Rescue Plan Act's Homeowner Assistance Fund to enable door-to-door -door outreach to the hardest-hit communities. We've prioritized reducing barriers for tenants and landlords to apply directly for and receive the maximum allowed amount of ERA funds in the shortest amount of time possible. The framework also includes actions to strengthen connections and coordination between court-based eviction diversion activities and the ERA program, exploring adding ERA program access points in the courts during eviction proceedings to increase awareness and fast track applications. We plan to use outcome data to ensure that communities most at risk are being served and so that this local effort in Indianapolis can be scaled to other ERA programs and courts statewide to help ensure that no one is left out of a stronger and more equitable recovery for all Hoosiers. Thank you and let me turn it over to Kyle Webster from the Pittsburgh Allegheny County program. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, my name is Kyle Webster. I am uh, the General Counsel of Action Housing. Action Housing is the lead subgrantee running the Pittsburgh and Allegheny County Emergency Rental Assistance Programs. I'm going to talk mostly about the collaborative and data sharing uh, models that we've been adopting here in the Pittsburgh area. Our team can, involves 26 nonprofits and community groups working collaboratively together to implement the Emergency Rental Assistance Program because we believe firmly that a successful rental assistance program requires investment in the community and true brutes on the ground, in addition to collaborative leadership that keeps things moving. 70% of all of our partners are minority-led organizations. We are also, as Action Housing, part of a peer sharing group that we helped uh, bring together through the Housing Partnership Network to ensure that we're working nationally to uh, compare best practices and keep up with what needs to be done to ensure that this program moves as quickly and as effectively as possible. On the data sharing front, we found that some of the biggest barriers to access to rental assistance is the need for follow-up documentation to meet uh, the federal government's requirements for the program. So we have done some intentional outreach to try to go around the need for the tenants to provide us with the income information we need, income information being the primary thing that is holding people up. And we've built uh, direct connections with local uh, hospital organizations, UPMC being our largest healthcare company in the region and a large administrator of Medicaid to get Medicaid approval letters in order to satisfy the income eligibility requirement of the program. We've also established a data sharing agreement with the state Department of Human Services, which is actually impacting programs statewide by providing direct information on SNAP benefits and eligibility to again, satisfy that income information Additionally, in order to prevent evictions to the degree that we can while this program plays out, we have built a direct connection with the Court of Common Pleas by staffing an action housing staff member who is working on the ERAP program at the Housing Court Help Desk and giving the court staff of both the Court of Common Pleas and our magisterial district courts here in Allegheny County direct access to uh, data on where applications are in the process and who has and has not applied 
for the program. That way the court can directly tap into our program to see who is uh, on the docket to be paid, where things are at, and also see what is missing in an application in order to work with that uh, person facing eviction to get what is needed in, in order to prevent that eviction from happening to move forward. We found all of these to be relatively effective means of moving this program forward uh, to try to get money in the hands of landlords as quickly as possible and intervene in the eviction process. I'm now gonna hand it over to Heidi Boyd from Hennepin County. Hello everyone, my name is Heidi Schmidt Boyd I'm with Hennepin County in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I um, am a program manager with the rent assistance programs there. Like other counties in the state of Minnesota, we've always determined eligibility for um, emergency assistance programs. And with COVID, we have also taken on the responsibility for managing our COVID rent assistance funds and programs along um, with and in partnership with the state of Minnesota. Today, I'm gonna to talk about Hennepin County's outreach efforts to people with incomplete rent assistance applications. I'm gonna just talk about the opportunity we had, the sense of urgency and what our response has been. First of all, the opportunity. Our state has hired a, a statewide processor for rent assistance applications and they were really brought on to focus on completed applications. So those that were had all the verifications and documentation that was needed. Um, there became a real sense of urgency with that, the model of focusing on complete applications in that our state legislature um, on June 29th uh, passed a bill that is gonna phase out our state's eviction moratorium. Our state's moratorium was actually more um, protective than the national moratorium. What the protections our state uh, has offered is that anyone who has a, a pending application for COVID, for federal COVID related rent assistance is protected from eviction um, until June, 2022. But starting September 13th, um, landlords can start filing evictions for those folks that, are not, that do not have a completed application. So our focus has been, and our response has been that we're reaching out to thousands of people who have, um, stopped mid mid application because the application was um, we're guessing was complicated required more documents than they had access to at the time so we're using phone email text we're calling and connecting with folks who have an incomplete application and sharing with them that the moratorium is is being phased out that the way they're protected is by having a pending application in the system so we We've advocated with the state to get access to um, both the tenant and the landlord component so that we were able to help both landlords and tenants get the information they need into the system. Um, we continually reinforce with our staff the importance of acknowledging kind of the, the stressful situations that um, tenants they are working with and landlords they are working with are facing in this time. So they're really bringing a, a person-centered approach to the work. And I think one of the real advantages that we're seeing is that because we are we're operating this with a lot of county staff, we are those staff have a broad knowledge of other assistance programs that they can link people into and connect people with. So that's been um, we're seeing a lot of successes in applications in, in in our county turning from incomplete to submitted, which will then protect them from eviction going forward. And I'm going to hand it back to Clarence. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, and for this last section, um, I just want to turn it over to Jean for a minute, um, who has been engaged with the, this community um, since the outset of, of um, ARP implementation, recognizing the role of the legal aid community uh, as a key partner on this. Yes, I, I, um, uh, we, we've recognized, and I think the entire philosophy behind uh, the summit, this webinar, is the view that we needed a cooperative group of people doing their part that included mayors, that included advocates, that included the housing organizations, that included the judicial system, but it clearly involved the, the reliance on our legal services, uh, uh, which are often the, the bulk, the champions who have been addressing this year uh, after year. Um, so um, I want to, um, you know, we recognize how important that is. And we also want to make clear that ERA funds and state and local uh, America, uh, American rescue plan funds can be used to fund and strengthen 
these types of services by our legal service community. Um, so with that, I'd like to just, uh, I'll, I'll uh, introduce our two, our two speakers. Just one, I wanna say Peggy Bailey has been just a critical partner for Noel and Erica and myself and others and representative of how integrated and crucial HUD is in every aspect of our housing and uh, rental eviction strategies. And then I also want to mention that Ron Flagg will speak after that. And conversations with Ron and the bar associations really were uh, what led to this um, uh, what led to this uh, summit, these webinars, and it was really their desire to realize that the court, the legal services, the bar association had to work together to be part of this. What were real inspiration. So I want to thank Ron for being on this, but also for the uh, role he played in inspiring this, this effort. So Peggy. Thanks, Jean. Uh, and thanks, Clarence, for, uh, for leading this section. Uh, and thanks to all of you who are doing the work every day to keep people in their homes during the pandemic. I don't have to explain to you the harm eviction causes families. And the fact that about 11 million households pay more than 50% of their income on rent shows the precarious position too many families found themselves into prior to the pandemic and leads to the concern we have for millions of families who have lost income during the pandemic. When you pay that much in rent, it is nearly impossible to create savings to weather even the smallest financial crisis. This concern is heightened for families of color which makes it essential for communities to target resources and eviction mitigation strategies to these and other marginalized families. HUD's work is centered in making sure that those who need the help the most get it, and that people who have historically been discriminated against or face racist practices against them are protected. So to do this, HUD has issued guidance and resources to explain how eviction practices can run afoul of the Fair Housing Act protections and we're helping the legal community support tenants. We're also pleased to announce that yesterday we released a notice of funding opportunity for $20 million in grant funds to nonprofit and government entities providing legal assistance to low income tenants at risk of eviction. We expect to provide between one to $3 million in grants to about 10 to 20 entities for eviction mitigation activities pre-trial during trial, post-trial, and as part of alternative dispute resolution and to avoid litigation. Those applications are gonna be due on September 8th. We've also engaged public housing agencies, tribes, and tribal designated housing entities to help them get assistance for HUD-assisted households who need it and educating their audiences, such as people on their waiting lists who we suspect are, 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 are in need of financial assistance or likely need of financial assistance on the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. We've also used the Emergency Re Rental Assistance Program and other housing-related relief resources to help people experiencing homelessness, this includes $5 billion in emergency housing vouchers that have been distributed to public housing agencies and are now starting to be used. And finally, we're directing technical assistance to HUD grantees to help them align practices and support the emergency rental assistance program and the other relief related resources. We know that there's a lot coming at cities and communities and states uh, uh, in, in relief resources. And we're trying to do at HUD everything we can to make sure that those resources are used as effectively and efficiently as possible. HUD is committed to this effort for the long haul. It should be a shame, it would be a shame to use these resources solely for the crisis at hand and not set up structures that can survive once the immediate crisis ends. Eviction was a problem prior to the pandemic and the solutions we're creating now should still exist for those in need while we move toward the president's long-term goal of universal rental assistance for all those who need it. So again, I wanna thank you for all your work that, um, that you're doing every day and for being a partner with HUD and the rest of the federal government in this work. And I'll pass it to Ron. Thanks, uh, Jean. Thanks, Peggy. And thanks to all of you for collaborating in this critical effort. 
I'm Ron Flagg, president of the Legal Services Corporation. LSC is America's largest funder of civil legal aid. Nearly all the 50 or so metro area teams participating in this critical effort are working with legal aid providers, and that's critical to the success of our efforts. None of the policy initiatives we've been talking about, eviction moratoria, eviction diversion programs, or distribution of rental assistance, none of those policy initiatives are self-executing. The success of those initiatives requires assistance to ensure that the benefits Congress, state, and local governments intend to distribute, in fact, reach the tenants and landlords who are the intended beneficiaries. Legal aid programs provide that assistance. Where sufficient resources are available, legal aid providers are highly effective first responders, helping to protect low-income Americans from losing their homes. Too often, however, people living in poverty do not have access to legal assistance when facing eviction. On average, in eviction lawsuits nationwide, landlords have legal representation 90% of the time, but tenants have representation less than 10% of the time, on average. And having access to legal assistance is often dispositive as to whether a family stays in its home or is evicted. The success rate of unrepresented tenants in eviction cases across the country is in many jurisdictions below 20%, and in some jurisdictions below 5%. I'd like to share data showing you the difference a lawyer can make in eviction cases. In 2017 to 2019, under New York City's then new right to counsel law, evictions dropped by nearly 20% in the neighborhoods where tenants qualified and nearly 85% of tenants represented by free lawyers through the program avoided eviction. Prior to Cleveland's right to counsel program, which just started last year on July 1st, tenants were represented in less than 2% of eviction cases, less than 2%. In the first six months of the right to counsel program, nearly half of the eligible households received representations. And how did they do? Tellingly, 93% of the clients at risk for eviction and represented by a legal aid lawyer avoided eviction. And after implementation of San Francisco's right to counsel program between 2018 and 2020, 67% of represented tenants were able to stay in their homes. Uh, contrast that, tenants with no representation or limited scope rep representation only 38% of tenants were able to stay in their home. As Gene said at the outset, these numbers mask things. Even one uh, eviction, it can be a tragedy. When you're seeing 93% of people staying in their homes, that's avoiding a lot of tragedy. So civil legal aid demonstrably makes a difference in keeping people in their homes. LSC and America's legal aid programs are available to collaborate with you in ensuring that government programs help the people who the programs were intended to benefit and keep low Americans in their homes. Keep doing your great work and please let us know how we can help. Thanks so much. Thank you, thank you, Ron. Um, before we go to our mayor's panel, um, uh, uh, it, it turned out that five or 600 people, we have a great participation uh, were having trouble getting in. And so I was asked to do an abbreviate, uh, abbreviated version of, uh, of the open framing. Uh, so I will do that. And my apologies to those if, uh, um, for hearing some of this twice. But I think the first point I don't have to make because it's already obvious that this is an action summit, that this is an action webinar, not about panels. What you're seeing here is about answering the questions, the examples showing the peer cases of how this can get done. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental point that I think several of us have made before is that our nation has never had a national infrastructure for, for preventable evictions. It is worth repeating that prior to the pandemic, we averaged 3.6 million, 3.6 million evictions per year with a large amount being only $500, $600 of, of, of back rent. Uh, these are pr many preventable evictions. Um, the pandemic 
requires us to fill that gap immediately. It requires us to set up that national infrastructure immediately on a decentralized basis, state by state, county by county, city by city. But the fact that it's uh, new and hard cannot be an excuse, uh, not an excuse at all. Uh, it's a responsibility for all of us to do everything we can to help the hundreds of thousands, millions of our fellow Americans who have been hurt by this pandemic, who are at risk of housing instability, uh, as well as the landlords who by no fault of their own can be facing economic stress, uh, again, uh, due to the, uh, due to the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, so this is, this is a responsibility on all of us. Every preventable eviction is a preventable heartbreak for a family. We have an obligation to do everything we can to prevent every, uh, uh, pre every uh, uh, um, uh, eviction that we can. Um, for us at the federal government, at the White House, at Treasury, at HUD, we feel that responsibility strongly. Uh, yes, this is a program where the money flows out to state and local governments, but we understand that it is our responsibility to do everything we can to listen, learn, respond quickly, and make sure that this is a program that can work well and get out on the ground. We heard many issues uh, related to the challenges of documentation, about people being excluded because they were receiving federal housing, uh, about the uh, um, uh, need for bulk payments, uh, uh, about the, to, the need to make sure that we could help people who had already lost their housing or future housing or were currently homeless. And what the guidance that we put out on May 7th and June 24th were our efforts to listen and respond quickly. Uh, uh, and we will, we are not done. We feel that responsibility to put, to continually look for what guidance we could put out, what convening we can do, what real, what we can do with reallocation authority, anything and everything we do. So we feel this responsibility every, every day. Uh, but I also want to make clear that we have created flexibilities and, and, uh, and, tools based on what we've heard that exists now. Um, we could not be more crystal clear. You can use self-attestation more. You can use categorical eligibility. You can use bulk payments. You can use direct payments uh, to tenants. You can use funds for people who are homeless or need future housing. We're not just quietly saying that we're making this crystal clear and we are encouraging many uh, uh, of these tools to be used. This is not a time for anybody to hide behind being overly cautious or overly conservative. We are making clear how you, can, how you can help. It's also a time that we are seeing success in using these tools all across different places all across the country. The fact that we've gone, we've doubled housing of dollars from to 1.5 billion uh, since May, in, these are the June numbers, and as Noel said, tripled the number of people being helped uh, from April to June is a sign of substantial progress, but also uh, clearly uh, a sign that we have a substantial way to go but it does show that these tools are being used successfully. So it's not a matter of whether it can succeed, but where it's succeeding. And again, all of us have to step up and do our part. Uh, we obviously feel this responsibility even greater right now with the, uh, uh, with the end of the uh, eviction moratorium coming. Uh, and as was suggested, talked about, I think on next July, on July 28th, a week from today, when the CFPB has what we think will be a very strong locator for people, we are going to make a major effort to get the word out. And if you'd like to be part of that effort, please 
let us know. But I think we have to let people know that these diversionary policies we're discussing and the emergency rental assistance is a win-win solution. When people, what we have found, what studies show, what the examples have shown is that when people are aware that this can make whole landlords and help keep people in stable, safe housing, that they respond very well. So we've got to do everything we can. Everybody we ask, go the extra mile, ask what else you can do. We promise we're doing that. We will continue to listen and learn and respond. And we ask all of you to do it as well. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our, uh, uh, our mayor's panel. Um, we have uh, uh, the mayor of Louisville and the mayor of Milwaukee. I just spoke to the mayor of Milwaukee. I have family that lives in Milwaukee. I am somewhat aware that when the mayor of Milwaukee looks over the last 24 hours, appearing in our summit may not be the single most memorable thing that happened in Milwaukee uh, in the last 24 hours, but we're happy that within his happiness, he is here as with the mayor of Louisville. And I wanna turn it over to Julie Rodriguez. I think that uh, uh, if you were to poll the senior staff at the White House on uh, the people we work with every day who, are the, who combine heart and effectiveness and getting things done, I'll tell you, Julie Rodriguez would be at the very, very top of this list. I just, you know, one of the best colleagues one could ever have. So let me turn it over to Julie. Well, thank you so much, Jean, and I echo the sentiment. Um, Jean and I always joke that um, our uh, partnership is really strong because he holds the um, purse strings for um, ARP funding for state and local, and I get the opportunity to work with you all to lift up the great work that you all are doing as um, leaders of our cities. So thank you all so much. I'll jump right in because um, you all want to hear from our mayors about the uh, you know effective work that they're doing. So with us today, we have uh, Mayor Greg Fisher from Louisville, as Jean mentioned, and um, Mayor Barrett from Milwaukee, both who have been tremendous leaders on um, housing and who have really demonstrated that they're committed to helping to um, support eviction prevention strategies in their respective cities and using um, ARP dollars to do so. So um, I'm first going to turn to Milwaukee Mayor Barrett. Uh, Mayor Barrett, so um, many of us have come to understand the damage of evictions on people's lives and communities um, through Matt Desmond's um, book, Evicted. And the book really centers on experiences of Milwaukee residents and communities. And on July 11th, you announced that the city was going to invest or allocate um, $30 million from state and local ARP funding to support housing activities. Uh, what kind of housing activities will you support and how will they help to prevent evictions? Well, thank you very much, Julie. It, it really is an honor to be part of this call with you and with Greg and with all everybody else. Um, as you can imagine, the spirits are running very high here in Milwaukee as we celebrate the Bucks NBA championship win last night. So we're, we're sky high in Milwaukee right now. But let me dig into housing and evictions, which are two very serious issues. Um, as you pointed out, Matthew Desmond shined a light on evictions in ways that exposed the scale of the problem and it's very real human consequences. While he focused on Milwaukee, I think we all recognize that the issues affect communities across the country. Thankfully, and I mean that sincerely, thankfully, the American Rescue Plan Act gives cities, including Milwaukee, an unprecedented opportunity to make major strides in addressing some of the challenges we face. So I've prioritized eviction prevention through investments in direct aid for rent, counseling, legal support, deferred payment loans, and more safe, affordable homes. Um, and I did this because before, before becoming mayor, I had the honor of serving in Congress, where I know members by necessity take a 50,000 foot view of problems like evictions. But as mayor, it is a very different perspective. Um, I see firsthand the people facing eviction. They are our residents, sometimes our neighbors, people who live nearby. I see the consequences on families, on neighborhoods, and on the whole city. So, so let me give you a few examples of the plans we are advancing with the ARPA fund. Um, we are spending millions of dollars to expedite the construction of shovel-ready low-income housing tax credit projects. Um, those have proved to be very, very effective, um, and we want to make sure those projects that are ready, some of whom are facing increased costs from construction materials, that we can get those moving. Um, and we will support work underway to increase access 
in availability, availability of homes through our housing authority of the city of Milwaukee. Our, our public housing here, the largest provider of housing for low income people in the state of Wisconsin. Um, don't forget your housing authority. I think that that's, that's a big, big part of this. I also have worked to coordinate our eviction prevention efforts um, with other levels of government in the Milwaukee area. Um, for example, we've worked very closely with Milwaukee County and we're investing in an eviction prevention right to counsel program. And I know Mayor Fisher will talk more about his leadership on this approach. And I just heard Ron Flagg talking about the importance. Um, I think that that is obviously a very, very valuable tool as well. We're also investing in our rental housing resource center. Um, this is a one-stop resource for tenants and landlords that offers mediation, offers advice, connections, and support to avoid bad eviction outcomes. And you'll hear more about that work from Deb Hefner in a few minutes as well. So one of my favorite programs, one that I'm directing an additional $3 million in ARPA funding to, is our compliance loan program. When a homeowner has necessary repairs but doesn't have the resources to pay for them, um, the city of Milwaukee loans the money. Uh, and rather than requiring monthly payments, we recoup the money when the property is sold. So just last week, I visited the home of Juanita and Wesley Jackson. Um, they were able to use the compliance loan program to repair the roof, a repair that they would not have been able to afford without this program. 78 years old, fixed income. They've lived in their home for 25 years. And just imagine what would have happened if the program were not available to them. We're also looking at energy costs. Um, we can get cold in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin energy bills can lead to an economic downward spiral for some homeowners that can also lead to eviction. So I plan to put $5 million into an effort that will assist low income households struggling with energy costs by providing upgrades and retrof retrofits that will reduce electric and gas bills. The ARPA funds allow us to prevent eviction in other important ways. Um, we're making big investments in job and workforce development so we can help our residents reach economic stability. We are coordinating with our workforce development board and our local technical college to connect residents with training and careers that put them in a stronger financial position. As Matthew Desmond pointed out, a shocking number of people live right on the edge of possible eviction. ARPA funds can move a lot of people to safer ground. We all know COVID has been a public health crisis, but it's also been an economic crisis that has affected governments, businesses, and most importantly, individuals. The American Rescue Plan recognizes that and will add economic support for many here in Milwaukee and across the country. President Biden, thank you for your help. Thank you so much, Mayor Barrett, and um, some great models that uh, hopefully other cities um, are able to utilize and replicate as they're looking at um, a comprehensive approach to addressing uh, evictions in their areas and, and also the stock of affordable housing, as you mentioned. Um, now on to Mayor Fisher, who um, I'll admit I haven't seen in a couple of weeks, and I was uh, a little concerned that um, your time as leading the U.S. Conference of Mayors meant we wouldn't be working together as closely, but Fortunately, you continue to do amazing things there in Louisville um, that we want to shine a spotlight on. And so um, Mayor Barrett referenced it, but just your right to counsel efforts have been a real model for um, cities across the country. And so wanted to turn it over to you to explain a little bit more about what you've set up and the impact you've had. Great. Well, thanks, Julie. It's always good to see you. And thanks for all of your wonderful help. And Mayor Barrett, great job yesterday. I saw you on the bench coaching the Bucks there in the final few minutes. So it was an amazing job you and the team did there. So we're proud of you guys. So I uh, know we're making good progress here in Louisville on what was a bad situation because of all the economic consequences of the pandemic. We've paid out now about 90% of the eviction prevention, prevention funds that we have been allocated. And so we've really put these to work, which I know is a problem to scale this up in a lot of cities, but we spent a lot of time leaning our process out here. Now, what the data shows us is that more than 71% of the folks that are getting the funds earn less than 30% of the area median income. So their uh, experience and sophistication with the legal system is not that great and they need help. So it was clear to us that we needed to establish a right to counsel program in partnership with the Legal Aid Society and local nonprofit with the Coalition for the Homeless. So what we do is that we 
listen to the calls coming in, whether it's over the phone or a lot of them, of course, are online. And we hear these stories of distress and just unimaginable kind of challenges that people have. So I think part of what our job is to help folks through times like this, because eviction obviously turns your world upside down, uh, whether it's the kids, the mom, or whomever. It's just something we want to avoid at all costs. Now, additionally, our housing team has staff that attends virtual eviction court daily so that we're inter interfering with uh, landlords that are trying to evict their residents. And we coordinate with judges to ensure that the cases that are going to be dismissed are, are dismissed against tenants who can benefit from rental assistance because we all know some of the landlords don't want to go through this process. This is like a no brainer if your city's not doing it. We are funding this through uh, ARPA funds, only $400,000. And we're getting this kind of coverage through the city that's saving you know, untold number of households from being evicted. Now, in addition to that, I just wanted to share another program that we have. We've got a million dollars spent on rapid rehousing for folks that are self evicting. So. They may not be as sophisticated again, so they get a scary letter from a landlord and they just say, okay, we're out of here. Now, when that happens, as you know, their ability to sign another lease is often, oftentimes endangered because they might have bad credit. They saw that they didn't were evicted from their last residence. So we, we provide one month's rent and a down payment uh, with this particular fund so we can get people back in housing. So we're proud of these programs. They don't cost much money. It is put certainly the humane thing to do. It's also the great thing to do economically. Just when somebody is uh, evicted, the cost to get them back in is three times based on uh, what it would be just to keep folks in there. So relatively straightforward. Every city should be doing it. Really proud of our team doing good work here. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Barrett and Mayor Fisher for again, just giving some great models that other cities can look to um, I won't uh, offer up too much of your time, but hopefully uh, cities can see you all as a resource um, as they're thinking through what options they have um, moving forward. But thank you all again for your tremendous leadership. I know we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, Jean Sperling, um, to take us into the next section. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And uh, just to put a, a fine point on what we just heard, the mayor of Louisville uh, already having used 90% of their funds, showing what's possible, but also using the emergency rental assistance program for council for the type of help. Uh, mayor Barrett talked about many things he's doing, but he will use state and local funds, nearly 2 million for their anti-eviction diversionary policy. So it's just very important to put the fine point on the fact that there are funds within the emergency rental assistance and in the state and local that can be used significantly for the type of diversionary policies that we're about to hear from. Now I'm gonna be, I'm just gonna do our introduction because last night, uh, Erica, Aaron and others and I talked with uh, our two panelists and we could have probably spent uh, two hours talking to them. We we talked a lot about uh, the eviction strategies. Uh, we had the letter from the Department of Justice that was released on June 24th that encouraged uh, judicial systems, local state judicial systems to use diversionary policies. Uh, but we want you to hear from two judges that are, are doing that in fact. Judge Brendan Murphy, who's the chief magistrate at Cobb County, uh, in Georgia, and Judge Rachel Bell, who is the Chief Sessions Court, Davidson County in Tennessee. And uh, I'm just going to get right to it because I just, you know, think what you're doing is so inspiring and hearing how it's actually done, I think is probably the most effective thing for a lot of people out there. So uh, with that, let me, uh, let me start with uh, Judge Bell. Judge Bell, just, you know, uh, we've talked about in theory, how does it work? How does the diversionary eviction diversionary strategy work in your court system that you, and that you help uh, uh, orchestrate? Thank you, Jean. I really appreciate um, you giving us the opportunity to share what we're doing here in the great state of Tennessee and Nashville, Tennessee. Um, most of you know that that's called Music City. But I am the presiding judge of 
our eviction diversionary court named Legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, we've worked streamline, by streamlining processes with our circuit court clerk, um, which is um, led by Richard Rooker, as well as Dr. Kroon, who is the executive director for our Metro Action Commission here in Nashville, Tennessee um, with the ERAP funds. And so immediately we started by sending a court order to all the pending eviction cases. I asked um, our court clerk to pull all the pending eviction cases that we had in Nashville when our courts were closed. And those to the tune of eight, 1,863 cases. Um, I also then asked him to send a letter um, to each one of those tenants and landlords, letting them know about the Housing Resource Diversionary Court and that we were um, ordering them to seek mediation. The Tennessee Supreme Court um, entered an order for us to um, order cases to go to mediation when the courts were closed. And so we did that. And then after sending out those letters, our courts opened back up a couple of weeks after that. And then I talked to my colleagues about seeing that I could have some housing court navigators that we call them now. And I didn't know that was the name of them until a couple of weeks ago when we were on the summit, but they've been housing court navigators and they've done a phenomenal job with our music city community court here. Um, I have two individuals that work with us. One of them is a program manager and one of them is a resource services officer. And they go into our eviction courts here in Nashville, Tennessee. We have two of them. We call them courtroom 1A, we call them courtroom 1B, but they're really our eviction courts. My colleagues, I have 10 other judges that work with me um, here in General Sessions Court. They allow them to make an announcement to the landlord and the tenant and to the attorneys in court every day to let them know about the Housing Resource Diversionary Court. And after that announcement is made, they meet them in the hallway to see if the case can actually be transferred from eviction court to our legacy Housing Resource Diversionary Court, which is every Tuesday. On Tuesdays, we have a three um, stage process for our court. Our first process is an initial appearance in which we um, talk to the landlord and tenant and see what the, what the issues are. The second appearance, um, they should have met with Mac who has a program called HOPE and they have housing um, navigators and housing court liaisons. They have a landlord um, coordinator and team. They have a tenant coordinator and team that works with them along with my um, two people that help me with the court. And they work to see what it is that they need to do, what documents they need to turn in, what struggles they be having um, working with the ERAP funds. And then we have our third appearance, which is settlement and pending payment. So we have this court is every Tuesday um, at one o'clock and then at two o'clock and at three o'clock. So we have three dockets. Um, since we started, we have helped over 1800 people. And I do wanna share that Metro Action Commission has over 4,522 applicants that have come to seek assistance. Of those so far, um, 1,200 of them have received payment, about 2,200 or, or so roughly are pending payment. And of the funds that were received, which is $20.8 million, and I, I give kudos to our mayor, Mayor Cooper, who did seek to work to receive this, these funds from the government. They spent $9.1 million uh, so far. And we've been able to help, as I stated earlier, over 1,200 people. So I know I can't uh, talk a whole long time. Like you said, it could be two hours for us to share. I want to be um, short and succinct. But there are a number of partners that we've had along the way, United Way and with the CARES grant funding. Um, like I said, the Tennessee Supreme Court who helped us streamline the efforts. But we're doing pretty good. Um, we're streamlining opportunities going forward. I know I'll talk a little bit about more about that here in a minute, but I want to share that's how we got started and was really working in, in tandem with the city and Metro um, MDHA. So thank you for letting me share briefly um, how we started our court and I'll share a little bit more later. Thank you. Thank you. That That is uh, just inspirational and uh, and how effective and you know systemic you have that. Uh, Judge Murphy, you had to start a little bit more by individual initiative. Uh, do you want to talk about how the diversionary uh, eviction strategies are working uh, in Cobb County as the, for you as the chief magistrate? Sounds good. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, we bring you greetings from Cobb County, Georgia. We're a community of just under 800,000 people right outside of Atlanta. Even pre-pandemic, our community saw approximately 20,000 eviction filings in our court each year. For our program, like many of you, the gold standard is to apply for assistance before an eviction is ever filed. And so like many of the speakers today, we had public awareness campaigns through social media, direct mailing, public access TV, flyers, all the traditional means. But then where the court came in was trying to think differently. How do we reach people directly that are most at risk of eviction and most need the aid? 
And so one thing we did was with the uh, packet that would go out when a new eviction is served, information about how to apply for rental assistance was included in that packet. We modified our summons so that tenants would receive that information when they received that first eviction action. We gave landlords information on how to apply for rental assistance when they came to file an eviction to see if they would consider applying for the assistance before even filing the eviction. And then court notices that are sent to both parties were also modified in case folks missed it the first time. Uh, but once a case gets to court, court-based rental assistance is absolutely critical. That's what both sides have told us. Here in Cobb County, we consider that to be the safety net for the safety net to make sure that even if you haven't heard of the program, even if you haven't had an opportunity to ap apply, you will have that opportunity at the very last minute before an eviction goes through. We're thankful to our chairwoman here, Lisa Cupid and the board of commissioners for their foresight in accepting the ERA one funding and uh, appropriating that to five rental assistance providers across Cobb County. Uh, that way we're a large geographical county. If you're in one area of the county and you, you're struggling, you need help, you can go to an organization that has helped you before, that you're used to um, helping with. And so those providers as part of our MOU are required to come to eviction court on a rotating basis, one per week. They help accept and process applications, scan documents if you're having trouble uploading your documents. And originally they came once a week. Now they have seen so much success in being here in court that they come twice a week, both times when we have eviction court. Through ERA funding, our board also provided additional part-time judge hours because we all know an eviction takes one court hearing. This process, as Judge Bell described, could take two or three. And critically, the ERA funding, our board provided a temporary position to the court. It's absolutely critical to bridge the parallel tracks of rental assistance and eviction. The eviction process under Georgia law is incredibly fast. It's faster than any rental assistance process could ever be. So for the two tracks to interact, there has to be somebody speaking. And for us, we're very fortunate that's a court-based personnel. Um, so far, we've been able to get out about a third of the $22.8 million in ERA-1 funding. And that's only since April, not including CARES Act funding that our board appropriated earlier. Uh, thank you. I mean, I think what's both so, I think, important for people to know is that in both of your states, you have very fast requirements and you know for evictions, and yet you've still been able to make these diversionary policies work. Uh, you know, I'm going to follow up with you first, Judge Murphy. What has been your strategy or how has it worked in terms of landlords? Has there been landlords resistance? What, and if so, uh, what has proved to be most effective in, in them choosing this alternative track? So it's a great question. Early on, we're fortunate that our board of commissioners before ERA-1 even came out, like I mentioned, they provided funding through the CARES Act. But that funding was provided so early in the process and to be able to assist the most uh, number of families, uh, landlords and tenants, there was a dollar cap and that funding didn't cover utilities. And so we had all hoped the pandemic would be a lot shorter than it has turned out to be. And so those dollar caps became a barrier for landlords accepting the assistance because they were not being made whole. And so fortunately, when ERA-1 came along, there was no hard dollar cap. You have the ability to pay utilities. You can look forward and pay rent going forward. And so our board streamlined the program to match the federal requirements with no additional burdens or barriers. All five uh, providers provide the same assistance, same rules of the road that the federal government has provided for us. So the key to buy-in from landlords is the on-site rental assistance piece. Cases get resolved, whether it's a traffic ticket, a divorce, a murder case, or an eviction case, cases get resolved when people are called to court. It's the time to decide for everybody. Would you prefer a check in your hand or a judgment that you may or may not ever collect? Uh, but the key is the landlords have to know that they are gonna get that check in their hand. So when the rental assistance providers came on site, I asked them, can you give us a good indication that if the landlord and tenant come up and meet with you, we just use an empty courtroom, no fancy space. We have an empty courtroom. If they go up and meet with you, and they give you their basic information, they'll provide the documents later. Can you give them a 75, 80% chance to say, yes, this is a good application? And they said, absolutely. Second piece is following through with fast payout. The landlord in our, under our legal structure, 
the landlord has to agree to continue the case in order for the case to come off the calendar and the rental assistance to go through. We have found that landlords, it's going up exponentially. As checks have been written, uh, landlords are much, much, much more likely to accept the assistance and agree to the continuance. And so those are the keys that we found um, in overcoming that barrier. Uh, that is really interesting that, that people are made whole, uh, that they think they're going to get it fast and you're doing it on site right there. So that's, uh, I mean, I think that is really uh, interesting. Um, uh, Judge Bell, I, I want to give you a chance to uh, uh, follow up too on, uh, you made some issues about your staffing, how that's helped. Uh, uh, what would you like to add too in terms of, of making uh, of what works to to make this program effective to have the big the large numbers that you've described. I mean, I would echo everything that uh, Judge Murphy um, just shared. Um, our court works very similar um, to your court down there. So it looks like we're using best, best practices and actually moving um, the needle, as I call it, um, to help marginalized people in the same way. But what I have seen uh, to really, really, really uh, give us more of an opportunity is having those court staff members in the eviction courts in the morning. Um, we may have uppers to 100 people on each docket every morning in courtroom 1A and 1B. And you know there are a number of people that are, are scared. There are a number of people that don't know exactly what's happening. They have anxiety. Um, I've seen my court staff have to calm people down and just ask them to take a deep breath. Um, I've also seen my court staff work really hard to get the landlords to understand exactly what uh, Judge Murphy just said, that it's better to get a check in your hand than a judgment that you're going to try to collect on. And then it's the right thing to do, right? We're trying to keep people housed. So after the summit, the Metro Action Commission um, and myself, along with the Tennessee Supreme Court and Legal Aid Society, uh, we got on a call. And in that call, we were able to uh, talk about what we thought that we needed. And we were, I'm very thankful from the White House. Um, we were able to secure two housing court navigators, along with the court staff that we already have now. And Metro Action Commission is doing a great job by coming to court. And so when I'm there, Judge Murphy, I asked, I asked the two housing court navigators and housing court liaisons, what stage is this application in? What payment are you going to be able to be able to make? And how soon is it going to be able to be made? Just yesterday, there were a couple of cases where the landlord said, I'm still waiting on the money. I want to transfer it back to trial. And I asked Matt, I said, what stage is this application in? Is it pending payment? They said, yes, your honor, it's pending payment. Actually, we just need the landlord to submit the ledger, the ledger of how much the tenant actually owed. I was able to continue it to our next housing resource diversionary court docket and kept the tenant in the house. So yes, it's good to have staff there, um, especially the individuals that are tendering, tendering the money. And then actually to be able to tell them immediately, what is it that we're missing with this particular case? The tenant may need to turn something in, the landlord may need to turn something in. But if we don't have people in the courtroom helping the landlords and the tenants, it's a challenge. And so we've stepped up and we're continuing to step up our mayor's office has created um, an affordable housing task force. I know I'll talk about that later. And a number of nonprofits that are working with the Financial Assistance Network with United Way. So we're all um, hands on. And I failed to mention the Metro Action Commission also has worked with a partnership to meet the landlord and the tenant at their apartment complex to let them know you have court tomorrow. Or also they're using a phone banking system, a text message system to remind the tenant don't miss coming to court because I agree with you, Judge Murphy. If you come to court, we can work with you. When you don't come to court, that's where the barrier is. So we're here to help and we're, we're doing you know, the very best that we can is shifting and moving every week as we know that there's something else that needs to be implemented or uh, taken away. Uh, boy, I'll tell you, I feel almost like we ought to do something just where we can hear from some judges like you doing it. We are running a little late. Uh, real quick, one last point each of you would like to make to somebody out there thinking about doing starting diversionary program just I know you probably have 15 each but just uh, uh, I don't want you to leave with that feeling of damn I wanted one more thing to say so here's that chance so uh, uh, Judge Murphy well if I had to boil it down to one thing I'd say our example shows that anyone can do this when the pandemic struck I'd only been on the bench here in Cobb County for eight months uh, eviction diversion, something as wonderful and built out that Judge Bell has, was a long-term goal of mine. When the pandemic struck, we had to do something. We recognize that a court's role is to be a fair and impartial forum for dispute resolution. We are not advocates, but we can't sit on the sidelines and let this rental assistance money go to waste 
when it's a win-win solution for both of the parties in our courts. So I'd indicate when we started, the way we started was our board of commissioners provided money to a rental assistance provider. I got them on the phone and said, hey, I know who's about to be evicted in Cobb County. It's the people on our docket, please come to court. Um, and it didn't cost me anything to do that. All it costs is the time to allow them to make an announcement and seek uh, to help people. And then the time to follow up and modifying the notices. And we recognize that for the providers, it's a little bit out of their comfort zone to come to court. For us, it's a little bit out of our comfort zone to be doing these wraparound services. And so by communicating, that will really help slow the uh, eviction piece down long enough to get the rental assistance piece up. I would be remiss if I didn't, the South has something to say, Judge Bell. South has something to say here in Atlanta. So I'd be remiss if I didn't shout out my colleagues, uh, Chief Judge Cassandra Kirk in Fulton County doing amazing work, Chief, uh, Chief Judge Beryl Anderson and, and Clerk Javon Hicks in DeKalb County, Chief Judge Christina Bloom in Gwinnett County. These women across Metro Atlanta are doing amazing work and that shows no matter what the size or scope of your community or resources, there's not one size fits all. Please just try something. We can all do something. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, that, really appreciate that. Judge Bell, Thank you, you. you will close this out. Okay. Well, I will close you out by my, my, my favorite quote is, justice does not stop at the courthouse steps. And you've got to step up. And then I have another quote, don't get weary in well-doing. This is the right thing. Step up, make a difference, learn the tools. You can YouTube it, you can Google it. You can call us 615-862-8341. You can look us up on the website. But I am willing, my team is willing, the city of Nashville is willing to step up. I want to shout out a, a covering to all of the judges across the state, to all the attorneys um, across the state that are doing this work. Um, it's very important that you look to see what you can do to help somebody, what you can do to move the needle for marginalized people and create initiatives and implement them. Don't just talk about it. Get busy helping people. And thank you to the United States, um, President um, Biden's office for, for to having the, the forethought to give us the ERAP funds. Thank you to Metro Action Commission, United Way. If I named all the people, it would take us too long and I don't want you to cut me off. But don't miss this opportunity to create something amazing to keep a roof over somebody's house. That would be my last, my last thing. Thank you so much. This has been an excellent panel and I feel uh, that there will be enormous interest uh, in this. And uh, of course, you know, the, the combination of the diversionary policies that you two are doing, plus the significant resources that will exist for some time really make this such a potential win-win for landlords and tenants and appreciate the initiative and appreciate the example. I know that, that for the, the many people on this call, this will make a big difference. Um, uh, with that, I'm now gonna turn it over uh, to the lead housing person in the White House, uh, Erica Pothik, who also with her uh, colleague, Aaron Schroyer, who's here with me right now, have done so much work, uh, Domestic Policy Council, not just in coordinating all the housing policies beyond the American Rescue Plan, but in making both the summit and the webinar to happen. So with that, let me turn it over to Erica. Thank you so much, Jean. And this has been such uh, an enriching conversation. And I, uh, even though we did a lot of work preparing for this and read everybody's reports uh, coming out of the last summit, I've, I've learned, continued to learn so much from you all. So thank you so much. We're gonna take a, a quick, a uh, tour of how philanthropy can help uh, these efforts on the ground. And with that, I want to introduce Susan Thomas, who's president and CEO of Melville Charitable Trust, and Tonya Wellens, the CEO of the Greater DC Community Foundation, to share more about what national and local philanthropy can do to support these efforts on the ground. Uh, and want to first start with uh, Susan, who I've known a long time. And uh, really delighted uh, so much by your leadership, Susan. And um, as part of the actions that the White House announced at the end of June to prevent eviction it's, and, and create and support greater housing stability, we featured the memorandum of understanding that Melville and HUD uh, recently executed to align philanthropic support at the local level. And um, first question to you is just, you know, why, you know, philanthropies can engage in a lot of different topics, why housing? Uh, and then share a little bit more about the roles that national and local philanthropies are playing in collaboration with the federal government. Sure, thank you, Erica. And thank you for the work that you're doing in this role. Uh, so our coll my colleagues 
uh, across philanthropy want to support um, the very work that we heard today that's happening on the ground. And so we want to see and are committed to supporting the creation of equitable communities. We've not seen equitable communities before in this country. We can close our eyes and imagine. We can imagine communities that have quality education, quality childcare, access to healthy food, clean air, clean water for people, no matter what their race and ethnicity are, no matter what their economic status is, no matter what their zip code is. Uh, and so it doesn't matter what our funding priorities are, where all of our funding can't go but so far if people don't have a safe and stable home in which they can live. That underpins all of the things that we want to see. And so that's why we're in this. Um, uh, and that's why we're in this together. And, and as Jean said, this isn't a time to be overly cautious or overly conservative. We need to get in the game. We need to pull together. And we need to do whatever it takes to get this done. And so the, the uh, Partnership for Equitable and Resilient Communities is a public-private partnership between philanthropy and, um, and the Biden-Harris administration. And so the partnership is coming together for two things, really. Um, for the administration of philanthropy to join together to encourage communities to respond to the crisis at hand and also to use the federal dollars in ways that, that create sustained long-term change to our system and put us on a path to creating these equitable communities. The second reason we've come together is to organize philanthropy around that, to really leverage the federal funding and support efforts in ways that the federal funding can't. And so, um, so there are two phases to the work. Uh, one, the first phase is to do exactly what we're talking about today, is to support communities in getting the emergency rental assistance out the door and to provide legal assistance to those who need it. And, uh, and so the partnership is here to match philanthropy with efforts on the ground that want to do the great kind of work that we've heard about today, but may not have the capacity. And so philanthropy's role can provide that capacity, excess capacity, people on the ground, outreach dollars, and then also for communities that don't, that do have uh, uh, capacity, but have not had a table set in their community to discuss how they can implement these things. Philanthropy can use its convening power to set that table. The second phase of the partnership is to um, create um, and provide intensive uh, support and sets of support for, um, for select sites. So that is a subset of the 46 cities that were part of the first summit, uh, tribal governments, and then also regions and to provide um, uh, the means to create an infrastructure by which communities and regions can not only absorb the federal funding that's already out there, but also the federal funding that is coming to set a long-term plan and to be able to execute that plan um, and, and deploy that funding. That's terrific. Thank you, um, Susan. And so, uh, Tonya, so at the White House Summit on June 30th, we intentionally invited a community foundation from every one of the 46 cities that we, um, we invited, some of whom had been engaged before in these efforts and, and some whom not. And um, I think it was our theory that community foundations play a critical role in bringing various parties together to tackle really hard issues. And we were so delighted to hear that Greater DC Community Foundation did precisely that coming out of June 30th. And would you share with us more about what you've been doing since June 30th and what you'll be doing going forward in the DC area? Absolutely. So I'm really happy to represent the Greater Washington Community Foundation. And uh, thank you all for that early invitation. And congratulations, Susan, on Melville's, Melville's uh, partnership with HUD. You know, community foundations are uniquely positioned to serve as a neutral convener, a facilitator, a partner, and a grant maker. Uh, we have access to a cross sector of partners and catalytic capital to make things happen quickly. 
And, you know, we're community centric, always looking for strategies to address the inequities in the communities that we serve. You know, I'll share that our mayor, Mayor Bowser and city leaders have been working diligently since early spring on strategies to prevent evictions and to make all who have been impacted in our city whole. Uh, but the call from the White House and this federal administration has really helped to accelerate our efforts in, in a more coordinated approach to addressing the crisis at, at, the crisis at hand and to pursuing new structures, policies, and efforts for the future. So with the DC Bar Foundation and the Urban Institute as co-conveners, the DC delegation has been meeting weekly since June 30th, nearly doubling our group size. Um, and we're really keen to make sure that we have all stakeholders at the table. So it's landlords, tenant advocates, local government, the courts, community outreach organizations, and our peers in philanthropy. We formed two working groups, both are co-led by a public official and a nonprofit leader. Um, and the first group is focused on working with our court leaders and staff to formalize diversion strategies that are currently being implemented informally, but will be under stress when the eviction violence uh, potentially might, may spike. Uh, the second group is focused on improving our rental assistance application and payment process and working with our city leaders to identify steps for in improving community outreach. So we have a few you know, short-term, long-term goals that include you know, really working with a strong number of community-based organizations who are already doing work and willing to do even more outreach to tenants to increase the number of tenants who are applying for rental assistance. We're also identifying partnership opportunities and connecting the dots between CDOs to government and to landlords in order to strengthen outreach uh, to the tenants who are most at risk of eviction. You know, and we're also very fortunate that DC courts are, um, they're, they're, they're committed to preventing evictions and have, a, have tenant friendly practices, again, we are looking at ways of turning those practices into policy and identifying ways that we can both support the courts with whatever they will need to implement policies and programs to, to strengthen uh, programs such as pre-court and same day mediation uh, programs. Again, a huge shout out to the DC delegation for responding to the call. Terrific, thank you. Um, I wish we had more time to dig in, but that was actually a wonderful introduction to our next panel. Thank you, Tonya, uh, to talk about the different roles, different actors and communities play. So I'm gonna invite them up. To Susan, Tonya, thank you so much for sharing a little bit more about what philanthropy can do locally and nationally. So our next panel is gonna dig into more uh, about how to do community and landlord engagement. Uh, and I wanna invite uh, Deb Hefner uh, from Milwaukee who already got a shout out uh, from her mayor earlier today. Uh, Joanna Allison, Executive Director of Volunteer Lawyers Project in Boston and Bob Claves from the Executive Director for the Chicago Bar Foundation. Um, each of you all attended the summit on June 30th and our attempt there was again to bring a cross section of actors, uh, all of whom have, have been with us today uh, in this webinar. Um, but we wanna turn now to in our last number of minutes before we, we end this webinar, the critical need to reach landlords and tenants at this time. And I think you are all doing this in different kinds of creative ways. You have been doing it, but you've all I think thought differently about how you are approaching it um, uh, in the next number of weeks. Um, so let me just get right to it uh, and ask you um, to reflect a little bit on the uh, approaches that you've used that have worked and what hasn't worked and what are you doing uh, in the next number of weeks to reach uh, landlords. So Joanna, let me um, start with you. And you are on mute if you'll need to come off mute. Um, thank you for doing this. Um, VLP was tasked, the, the governor of Massachusetts decided that it was um, as important to have representation for tenant, for landlords, low-income landlords as it was for tenants. And so VLP was tasked with a statewide project um, to assist the landlords. We have tried several um, ways to reach these folks because they're um, through landlord associations and um, through media, social media, et cetera, and found that that was not really um, really super helpful um, because some of these folks were, were not attached to any landlord association. They were usually um, owner-occupied, low-income folks, oftentimes with, um, not limited, with limited English proficiency. 
So we are now doing, um, we've identified communities that have the most um, owner occupied landlords and we are doing a, um, a door knocking campaign to reach them with um, flyers and um, also with um, people to talk to them in the various languages about the, um, the possibility of working with um, legal aid and other agencies to um, upstream to, um, to prevent the eviction from ever being filed, get the money for the landlords where the um, eviction can be prevented. Perfect. Right. So the, now we're talking about upstream, reaching people further and further upstream. Deb, the mayor already gave a shout out. Sounds like you're getting some resources from the city uh, through the um, state and local funds and, and share more about what you're doing uh, to reach landlords and tenants. Yeah, absolutely. So we are in the process of launching our Milwaukee Rental Housing Resource Center, which really the effort was underway prior to COVID, um, but the timing could not have been any more you know, better in our responsiveness. Um, so the center is really, it's, it's a combined collective effort of nine co-partners, legal mediation and rent assistance, really trying to be that one-stop shop for landlords and tenants. What makes us unique is that we have the Apartment Association of Southeastern Wisconsin, which is the largest trade association of landlords um, as a co-partner of this effort. Um, so they have been on the ground with us you know, throughout the formation and have been absolutely critical in the messaging you know, throughout COVID um, around rent assistance and just accessing different services as an alternative to eviction. Um, so most recently, um, we were able to work with the Apartment Association, as well as the courts and the other co-partners to create flyers um, where eviction summons are picked up, either um, live um, or online. It's really just, um, again, just getting someone that's, you know, think, a landlord that's thinking of filing um, to pause and, um, you know, become aware of the other resources that, that exist that are, you know, more time and cost effective, um, such as rent assistance. You know, Community Advocates, the organization I work for, we're providing the direct emergency rental assistance for Milwaukee and Waukesha County. So that's especially been, you know, really helpful for us as well, just being able to get um, that um, streamlined information out about the resources. Um, and so, you know, the Apartment Association is also providing us with opportunities to speak at their member meetings. Um, you know, throughout the pandemic and just having that opportunity to continuously update in real time because we all know how critical transparency is, um, you know, throughout the process has also been, you know, extremely helpful um, to us. Great. I'm hearing a lot about design, messaging, simplification, flyers, maybe not digital media as ways that door knocking, some very high touch but important ways to reach folks. Bob, um, you uh, helped to facilitate the Chicago session. Uh, what has Chicago been doing um, since uh, June 30th? Yeah, I, just a quick background for those who aren't familiar with it. So we're one of the partners in our Cook County Legal Aid for Housing and Debt Program is the name of it, CLAD for short, um, which is our county, city, our circuit court, the bar, a number of legal aid and community partners and other government partners. So it's a big collaboration to try to help. And from the very beginning, we have helped both landlords, small landlords and tenants get access to the resources of this program, including legal assistance that was designed that way. Because the small landlords in particular, I mean, while tenants are far more often in need of this and at, at disadvantage of an already represented landlord, small landlords who are often less sophisticated are struggling with some of the same things when they're unrepresented in court and, and prior to court, uh, having access to that assistance is just as important when we're trying to get fair and equitable resolutions that keep people housed and keep our communities strong. So um, that's been a part of it from the beginning, but our session since the summit though, uh, one of the judges actually first brought this up was, some of the small run sophisticated landlords are not connecting to all these other resources that are out there before court, no matter what, you know, all the efforts we're trying to do. And we're always going to try to keep people from getting into court, but a lot of them are filing almost mistakenly or without knowing that they had real alternatives uh, because they just weren't able to connect with them. So the idea is we're going to create a checklist that will be available on the court sites and in the outreach, hopefully, and, and you know, through other communications that's a very simple checklist that starts with, hey, stop. If you've not already investigated rental assistance or some of these other alternatives, do that now, don't, don't file. 
All right. Don't file until you, you know, it's a last resort and, um, and show them where they can connect to some of these resources in the program, but then make sure if they're going to file that they're doing it thoughtfully and that they've thought things through. And if they already are in court, the program from the beginning is, I want to just stress what the judges said and others said earlier in the panel. We don't want to give up on the idea of being able to resolve it through rental assistance or otherwise, and having representation is really important then too. So the, the checklist idea and getting that into the community is the big one. The other big idea was uh, it's still being built out, but one of our legal aid partners actually came up with the idea of a, a messaging campaign with the moratoriums ending just because you can doesn't mean you should, uh, is the title of it. And, and just because landlords, and there's a lot of bad blood that's built up during the moratoriums and the pandemic with a lot of these folks, don't come right away and file, kind of think about these other alternatives first and really try to put a strategic messaging campaign out to try to do that. Take a pause, I think uh, is, is a way of thinking about it, right? Is take a pause, think about these other options. We've, I think, made it very clear today, there are resources at the state, county, and city level, in most cases, definitely at the state level, uh, and oftentimes at the county and the city level that are available, uh, and lots of people who want to make sure that they get in the hands of um, tenants and landlords. Um, just as we wrap very quickly, in the next uh, coming weeks, what is one thing that you all are planning to do uh, to, again, reach landlords and uh, help them take that pause and, and help them think about the opportunities to to um, resolve these uh, you know, disputes uh, equitably. Um, let me start with you, uh, Bob, again, and then we'll go Joanna and Deb. Yeah, and I didn't mention mediation, but that's in court, but trying to get that out there in advance. So I think we're gonna really focus heavily in the next few weeks on trying to reach landlords before court uh, and, and really go big on that with that messaging campaign and outreach resources and the checklist. Great, Joanna? Um, same thing for us. Upstream is everything because once a case is filed in Massachusetts, it can prevent a person from getting an apartment in the future. Um, and we're working with the courts to give out flyers and we have a QR code for people to scan um, through the court um, to tell landlords what's available to them, where they can get the help and how they can, um, how can they can circumvent this eviction process and get the money that they need. Great. Deb. Well, we're going to continue the outreach efforts that are already underway and, you know, building on these partnerships. Um, we're also going to be launching a, a regional campaign um, in southeastern Wisconsin for uh, rent assistance availability. Um, and then also just continuing to streamline our rent assistance process to make those uh, access to those funds quicker and more efficient. Terrific. Thank you all. Uh, you've helped bring some important closure uh, to uh, this webinar, to this summit, and appreciate all the work you're doing. And we wish you well, because uh, we need you and we need all your efforts uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you so much. With that, um, I am just going to close the summit with a, a note of gratitude uh, to um, the partners here in the White House who have helped to carry this uh, off, uh, notably uh, Aaron Schroyer, uh, who <laughs> has been in communication with so many of you, who is a terrific partner in this work, and Gene Sperling, without whom uh, this would really not be possible for his leadership, um, and, uh, and to all the partners at Treasury and HUD uh, who you've heard from today. Um, thank you so much uh, for tuning in. And, um, and for most of all, for doing the work that you do each day, we are um, grateful for it. Um, thanks all, take care, bye-bye.